Um, all right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Matt Fuller, and today I'm going to be speaking about um, Presto and Cloud Native uh, SQL on anything. Um, and before I get started, uh, I just kind of want to get um, a lay of the land. You know, who here, raise your hand, who's heard of Presto, the open source project Presto? Okay, great, cool. This is great, because uh, today I'm going to be speaking about uh, Presto and sort of the basics and background behind it. So um, by the end of the talk, you will have uh, learned about Presto. And of those few hands who have heard about it, who's actually used it or tried it? Excellent. Cool. Awesome. All right. Great. <coughs> so in this talk, uh, we will learn about uh, Presto, which is an open source project, learn its background and architecture. Um, and then after we go through that, we'll learn about uh, Presto and Kubernetes and uh, using it on Red Hat OpenShift. And then finally, we'll talk about the Kubernetes operator and um, and uh, how we, we can participate in the open source community. Um, it's Presto. Um, so, you know, kind of start off and cut cut to the chase. And we'll talk about um, how we got here, but. Um, in collaboration with partnering with Red Hat, um, we now have a Presto Kubernetes operator that you can deploy to uh, Kubernetes distributions such as um, Red Hat uh, OpenShift. Um, so we will talk about that. We'll get to that by talking about Presto and what the operator is. And, and this might make more sense to what it means and how you can use it. Um, so, you know, first, what is Presto? Well, it's a community-driven project, and you can think of it as uh, SQL on anything. Um, it's, it's an open source project, and it, it looks like a database because it speaks SQL, but it actually isn't a database because it doesn't actually store any data. What you can do, though, is by issuing SQL queries through Presto, you can reach out to virtually any data source um, on this particular diagram are um, some examples of data sources that you could reach out to, whether it's files on Ceph or um, other distributed storages like S3 or um, relational databases such as MySQL or Postgres or even non-relational data sources, whether it's Cassandra or Kafka. And we'll talk about more about how you can accomplish that with uh, Presto. <coughs> so it's a community-driven open source project. It was originally created and open sourced uh, at Facebook. So at the time, um, this was back in around 2012 or 13, uh, there was a 100 petabyte uh, data warehouse using Hive, um, which is another uh, SQL tool, if you're not familiar. And uh, the problem with it is it wasn't performant to scale to uh, Facebook's needs, uh, so they set out and they created Presto. Um, so fast forward a bit and uh, it became a really um, uh, popular project being used by companies, not just Facebook, but LinkedIn, Airbnb, Uber, Netflix. So a lot of companies that had large amounts of data that they needed to run SQL analytics on. And over time, it became really hardened and battle-tested to really work at that, at that scale. <clears throat> um, so from the beginning, it was really for this high-performance uh, scale, high concurrency, and so on. But one really cool part about Presto is this notion of separation of storage and compute. So unlike a traditional database that's managing the storage, Presto doesn't store anything. All you do is you issue your SQL queries to it, and it reaches out to the different data sources. So <coughs> this is really neat because it, it works really well um, in a variety of environments. So for example, whether it's public cloud or private cloud, um, you could keep your your data in uh, an object store uh, like Ceph or S3, um, you know Azure's uh, Blob Storage or Google Cloud Storage. Um, so you keep all your data there, and then you can uh, just provision the compute layer when you want. We'll talk about how we can do that in Kubernetes, but you can also do it in cloud environments as well. You can deploy it practically anywhere. So. Why that's really neat is now you don't have to have the system running all the time. You can provision it when you want to. You can scale it out and in as you want to, right? So if, if you have a lot of demand on the system, you can just add more uh, horsepower to it. We'll talk about that more when we talk about Presto's architecture and, and how that works. Um, but because of this, it, it gives you SQL on anything. Um, 
Another piece we'll talk about uh, later is um, how you can integrate data from different data sources. So if we go, if we go back to the slide um, where I said you can issue a SQL query and go to these variety of data sources, in the same SQL query you can actually reach out to multiple data sources and join it together. So um, it eliminates the need to move data around if you don't have to. And then finally, there's no, there's no vendor lock-in, right? You don't have to run this on a Hadoop distro. It can query data from Hadoop like HDFS, but you don't, you don't have to. Um, or you could, but you can run it on MapR or Cloudera or Hortonworks um, or outside of Hadoop. Um, there's no storage en engine lock-in. It's, it's, very, it's very open. You can, you can run it wherever you'd like. Uh, and it queries open data formats, whether it's ORC uh, format or Parquet, which are uh, a type of uh, uh, file that you can keep data in. And then finally, there's no cloud vendor lock-in. You could run this on the public cloud. You can run it on a private cloud. So it gives you that optionality and flexibility of the system. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, it's used by many well-known Presto uh, there are many uh, well-known Presto users, whether it's Uber, or Twitter, LinkedIn, Slack, Netflix, uh, Facebook, of course, uh, and many others. Um, this is really just a, a small sample of the amount of users in the community that are, are using it. Um, but a lot of these are using it at a pretty large scale. Um, so now that I've given the background about Presto, I'm going to talk about the Presto architecture. Can we give you a better idea of how this system actually works, how it actually scales, and um, also kind of provide the, the background for how this will actually work on Kubernetes as well. So there's really two main components in, in Presto. There's what's known as a coordinator and what's known as a worker. You can think of the coordinator as the brain of the system and the worker as the, the muscle of the system. So the user on the left here sends their SQL query that they want to query a data source. Could be data that's in Oracle or Postgres or, or data that's in Ceph or S3 or, um, or Hadoop data. But the query comes in to the coordinator, and it really has three primary responsibilities. Uh, so it parses the SQL, which is basically just a text string, and it transforms it into an internal data structure that uh, Presto knows um, how to operate on. And it goes through an optimization process. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about cost-based optimizations in, in databases today, but you can think of it as um, SQL is a declarative language where you're declaring the, the data that you want to get. You're actually not actually specifying the steps. You're not saying do this, 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 and the other thing. You're relying on the database system to actually figure that out. And so because of that, there are many different ways to um, process the SQL query, and the optimizer is task of figuring out the most efficient way to get you the results that you want the fastest. So that's what the optimization phase goes through. Then finally, it goes through scheduling. This is where it takes what's known as a plan, which are the sequence of the steps that you have to process the SQL query, and it will schedule that work on the, the muscle of the system, the workers. So Again, I was saying, you know, Presto doesn't store any data, so it's not technically a database. It's really a SQL query engine. So how does that work? Well, there's this, there's this notion of uh, Presto's uh, connector architecture. So in order to, to query any of these um, data sources, you, there ha Presto has to have a connector for it. So the coordinator will reach out to the, the data sources via use of a special connector. And what this connector does for the, um, the coordinator, for example, is it can return metadata. Because Presto is a storing thing, it doesn't have metadata. It doesn't know the table names. It doesn't know the column names. It doesn't know the column types. It has to get that information from somewhere. So that's the connector's responsibility. It reaches out to the different data sources. They all provide the metadata in different ways, but it transforms it back into something Presto understands. Um, you know, you can think of it as, you know, a connector from going from HDMI, right, into my laptop, right, as a kind of a, a crude analogy, but um, it's, it's translating something into something um, the other end understands, right? And um, so once it has that metadata, it processes the, the, the processing to happen on the workers. 
And that also goes through this connector architecture and the connector to actually get the data from the system. So in, in the case of distributed storage like HDFS or SAF or S3, um, it's actually reading those files and streaming them through back into the workers. In the cases of relational databases, it might be issuing uh, SQL queries. So if you're, if you're issuing a SQL query to Presto to query data from Postgres, it will push down part of that SQL query into Postgres to get the results back to the workers. <clears throat> now, Presto is a distributed system, so you could have one worker or you could have a thousand workers. The more workers you add, the more horsepower you add to the system. So if you, if you want to get more performance, you can add more workers. And this is where, um, uh, where it works really nice on uh, cloud, private cloud, and Kubernetes because um, you could set up what is known as auto-scaling. So, so based on the, the load that you're putting on Presto, you can, you can add more workers, and then queries will get faster. It's a distributed system, so um, the plan is basically uh, cut into pieces, and, and each worker, well, you can think of it as like a, a piece of, of the plan to work on. It will work on chunks of the data at a time. Um, so when you're doing that in parallel, you're going to get much greater performance rather than if you had to read, rather than having something read all the data at once, naturally it makes sense. If you can split it, if it's, if it's parallel in some way and you can split it, you're going to get better performance. <clears throat> so this plan, these workers could be much more complex. If you had a really complex SQL query, if, if anyone here is familiar with writing SQL, they can be really simple or they can be these massive pages and pages of, of queries. Presto will do either. It, it, can, it can handle pretty much any SQL query you, you could throw at it. Um, but the more complex, the, the more complex the plan is, and actually the more important query optimization is to make sure that you can, you can get uh, good performance. So the data flows through these workers, um, and depending on the complexity of the query, it may have to redistribute data, meaning a piece of the data might be have to send over the network to other workers in order to compute the um, the query uh, appropriately. So when the query is done processing, it will go back to the coordinator and send the results um, back back to Presto. So let's double click into like what this connector um, architecture looks like. So here's another way to look at it. If we want to double click between you know into these arrows, these these red arrows where the data sources are, we have the Presto coordinator on the left and the the Presto worker on the right here, and this is you know, if you were to look in the code, it's not going to look exactly like this, but conceptually you could think of it this way. And um, there's what's known as an SPI, and um, each connector has to implement um, certain required methods uh, in order for Presto to work. So, for example, the Presto coordinator will, you know, let's just say it calls a method, get me table names. Well, the, the Hive connector will have to implement the method called get me table names that returns the list of table names in a, in a format that Presto expects. Same with Cassandra and Kafka, MySQL. Um, and because Presto is actually pluggable, um, if you have some sort of data source that Presto can't query from or is some proprietary data source or a custom data source, um, you could write your own connector. Um, or if it's a data source that just Presto wasn't shipped with, you could write your own connector, and the, the complexity of it varies depending on what your data source is. Um, if it's a relational database, they're relatively straightforward because relational databases has rows, tables, columns that kind of map naturally into um, Presto. Um, but if it's something more complex that isn't um, naturally relational, let's just say Kafka, for example, it gets a little bit more tricky. So um, you know, if you're familiar with Kafka, it's, it's basically a distributed um, uh, pub-sub system, and you can subscribe to topics to, to read from messages you're getting pushed to, pushed to the topic. Um, so uh, in that case, the, the implementer of the connector has to figure out what is a table what is a column? What is a row? In the case of something like Kafka, the, the topic, the, the thing you're subscribing to, appears as a table in Presto, and each message will appear as a row. Um, and then it's up to you what you want a column to look like. Um, 
So there's the data stats SPI. So if you want your, your data sources to um, work with the, the cost base optimizer in Presto, you have to provide data statistics to it so it knows how to operate on the data. Uh, the data location is where is the data located? Um, you know, what is the, uh, for a relational database, what is the, the JDBC endpoint? Um, for distributed storage, like where is the physical location of these files? Um, so here's like, if you double click into more, it's a little bit more technical. I'll just kind of briefly go over this, but each of these workers has a, an operator pipeline in them. So these operators could be read me the data, do a filter. So if you want, if you have data with, um, maybe there's a, a state column in it, you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, California, but you only want to return the California rows. One of those operators will be doing that filter so that only pulls out the, the rows where the state is from California. It might be doing an aggregation if you're doing a sum or a count or um, standard deviation or something. So each of these operators have a task for what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about the Presto ecosystem now. Um, and then I think at, at this point, you'll have a pretty good basic understanding of Presto and we can talk about how this fits into uh, Kubernetes. Um, so the, the most popular and widely used uh, connector in Presto is called the Hive connector. Now it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, it was originally written to query from the Hive data warehouse, um, that is HDFS, um, but it is just a, a list of files, right? So if you're using the same sort of Hive table format where um, if you think of uh, files and, and directories, right? A directory represents uh, a table name and all the files in it. It could be one file or multiple files in it uh, represent the data um, of that table. Um, so if, as long as you replicate that on the different distributed storages, whether it's SAF or HDFS or Google uh, or Azure or AWS, um, the Hive connector will work there. So you can think of um, Hive as, as three things. First of all, it's a SQL engine that was developed um, before Presto's time. Um, and it was really clever where it, it took what is no, um, were known as MapReduce jobs, which is a, a compute engine on Hadoop, and actually translated it to, um, you'd run SQL, it translated to a bunch of MapReduce jobs to process the query. I'm not gonna go into too many details about Hadoop and MapReduce, but just take for granted that that existed and it was, it was, it was slow, but um, that's what was done. And, but what came out of that was this notion of um, a Hive data warehouse, and, and that's how data is particularly formatted there. And that's, that's sort of the, the, the background behind the name. Now, there are really three, three parts to Hive. There's the, the actual way you're storing data on disk. Um, then there's the, the metadata catalog. And then there's, um, finally, the execution engine. So the Hive connector uses two of those three. It uses the, meta, the metadata store. Um, and um, knows how to read this particular table format. What Presto does not use is the Hive runtime, because Presto is essentially replacing that Hive runtime, because Presto was developed to be much more fast, performant, and efficient than Hive. But um, Hive has a really good meta store and a really good way of representing um, tables, so it leverages that. But the other cool thing, this is where separation of storage and compute comes into play, is that you don't have to move the data. If you had your Hive data warehouse and you've deployed that in your infrastructure, your company, um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to migrate or anything. You can just point Presto at it and it can start querying the data. <coughs> um, the other um, public connectors are relational database connectors. So um, Presto will connect to these um, over JDBC. Um, you don't have to worry about this. Presto figure this out how to do. So when you issue a query to, to Presto, Presto will know how to issue the particular SQL query to um, this database. So to your end users, it actually might be transparent that they're even querying data from Postgres or even querying data from Oracle. Um, all they see is just its tables in Presto. Um, so this can also solve sort of the data silo problem where you have to remember, oh yeah, for this data I have to go over here, and for this data I have to go over here. Now you can point your users at one system that's Presto, kind of access all your data. And that's, that's one of the values of the relational database um, connectors. 
Um, and for performance um, optimization, you can push filtering down. So the example I gave earlier about uh, filtering on state columns, you know, you want to only return the users that are from California. Um, you could pull all that data back into Presto, and Presto does the filtering, but the more you're moving data across the system, the, the more time and effort it's going to take, right? So if you can eliminate data earlier in the processing pipeline, um, then you're going to get better performance. So um, you can push down these filters um, uh, to, uh, to the database um, to return um, middle amounts of, a minimal amount of data. And then finally, there are non-relational uh, data sources as well, um, whether it's Accumula or Cassandra. Um, Elasticsearch is one that went in recently. Um, MongoDB, uh, Redis. Um, and the, the community is constantly uh, uh, contributing connectors back, so this list is only going to grow uh, over time. But if, again, if there isn't uh, a data source that you want to query from, um, you could always write your own connector and drop it in as a plugin, and of course contribute it back. <laughs> so now that we have uh, sort of a background of, of Presto, I want to talk about Presto and Kubernetes now. So again, I want to do another attendee poll. Um, who has heard of Kubernetes? Way more hands. Cool. Um, and who has tried or, or uses Kubernetes? Okay, less hands, but still more hands than the, than the Presto uh, question. Cool. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about how these come together. Um, so it seems like most people know Kubernetes here. I do have some slides to kind of set this up, but I might go a little bit. I'll still go over them. I might be, go over a little bit uh, quicker. So it seems like a lot of people have um, uh, uh, knowledge of it. Um, uh, but yeah, so Kubernetes is a, a Greek word. Uh, when I looked it up, um, I was like. What is Kubernetes? Where did this word come from? Uh, and it's apparently a helmsman, pilot, navigator, and it finally, you know, after you know, reading through the internet, and it clicked on me that it's a container orchestration, right? You have the the, the helmsman of a container ship, right? Um, so it's also, of course, an open source container orchestration engine for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. Um, so we're going to talk about how this relates to Presto. So how do we containerize Presto so that it can work on Kubernetes? Uh, you may see in the slides um, K8S, which is just shorthand uh, for Kubernetes, because having written it a, a lot of times, it actually um, becomes annoying. K8S is uh, much easier to write. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, uh, you know we. Starburst um, partnered with uh, Red Hat um, to provide a Kubernetes operator and um, Presto container on Red Hat OpenShift. And so now, um, you know, going through the container catalog, you can you can use our operator and container and actually run Presto on your your Kubernetes uh, distribution, uh, Red Hat OpenShift. Um, and, you know, and why why is this important, and and why you know why are we involved as, as well? And um, so, uh, so Presto is an open source project. We have a community edition. This is the the free version. Um, you know that that you can get everything in open source. Um, and and we at Starburst, we constantly will be patching it, so you kind of get a very stable and tested version of it. Um, now, if you're an enterprise organization, this could be important because you can try you can try Presto out. You can use it in Kubernetes, um, but if you want those extra enterprise features um, or the kind of the the, the high touch support that we provide, you could come to Starburst and um, and get that um, uh, initial features, uh, long term support. So. Um, not forcing you to do a major upgrade because some bug fixes in a, a much uh, more recent patch, right? We'll do you know, patch backporting and so on. So, um, so you can start out using um, you know the community edition, but if you if you kind of need that extra enterprise touch, you, you can come to Starburst. Um, so you know briefly why Kubernetes. Um, I actually like this picture. I did not draw it. I, 
and I, I gave credit so, um, but I got it from Kubernetes website. And, um, you know, so you know, going back in the time machine, right, you just would run applications on um, just an operating system, right, Red Hat. Um, that, you know, is inefficient, right? You might have to over-provision for resources or there's contention resources. So um, then VMs came out, which, which are better. You get more efficient use and better utilization um, of your application. You can isolate the applications from each other. But the really cool thing about containers is that you can think of it as like a lightweight VM where it's not packaging the operating system and all the, the libraries you need and the application. It's packaging exactly what you need and it can run on top of uh, the operating system. So containers uh, made kind of deploying applications uh, really, um, really beneficial, but one thing is the complexity of maintaining these become, became complicated. So, uh, you know, imagine if you had an application that has many containers, right? How do you actually orchestrate them? So that's what Kubernetes helps with, is sort of the orchestration of, uh, and management of these containers. Um, you know, so as a brief concept, the uh, Kubernetes cluster is made up of um, uh, nodes, and you know, kind of adding these these nodes to the to the cluster um, increases the CPU and memory available. Um, but the Kubernetes, they don't it doesn't actually run the containers where applications like Presto runs. It actually runs pods, and these pods run containers. So skimming forward. Um, you know, we've containerized Presto to run um, within a Kubernetes pod. So if you remember the diagram from Presto where you had a coordinator and workers, coordinator could be running in a pod, and then we use what are known as replica sets to run the workers. So you can, um, you know, as a, as a pod becomes more popular or has more demand, you can configure it so that you can auto-scale the amount of pods and therefore the amount of Presto workers to um, to, to add to the system. Um, so, you know, let's take a, a look at what Starburst um, Presto on Kubernetes architecture actually looks like. So we we have what is known as an operator, which I have a, a slide in, in, a, in a minute to kind of describe exactly what that is. Um, then we have the Presto coordinator in a pod as well as the Presto workers on, on the pod. Um, we also provide the Hive Meta store service. So if you remember from a few slides ago, I was describing how um, if you're querying from distributed file storage, uh, there is no catalog. You have to have a catalog that tells Presto what are the table names, what are the column types, and so on. Um, so if you want to query from distributed storage, uh, we'll, we'll provide that catalog for you so you don't have to provide it on your own. Um, and then finally, we work with the, you know, the horse, horizontal pod autoscaler so that you can scale up and down your, your Presto worker nodes. So again, like the really cool thing about Kubernetes is it's platform agnostic. You, you could run it on Red Hat and Shift. We have the certified operator for it. Um, but if you happen to be running it on, on Azure or Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services, you can move the application to and from there, right? So if you're on Google Cloud and you want to move it onto OpenShift, you can do that. You don't really have to reconfigure much. It kind of makes the, the hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, um, whether you know public or private, um, uh, really transferable. Um, so, so you typically don't just launch the pod directly in the, the cluster. You use this abstraction called um, deployments, where you kind of declare um, the layout of how you want Presto to work. And that's what we, we have to, to help deploy Presto on Kubernetes. Um, so remember when I mentioned earlier that SQL uh, was declarative, you're kind of defining the results you want and then it, it figures out how to get the results. Um, I think of Kubernetes as declarative where you're just kind of describing exactly what you want and Kubernetes handles the management of how to do that, how to deploy containers. Um, if a container goes down, how to bring it back up so it's kind of um, self-healing. And so Kubernetes uh, eases the burden and complexity of this. Um, yeah, so going back to, uh, you know, to here, um, I want to talk about the, the Kubernetes operator, which is sort of the, the key to how we have Presto working um, uh, on Kubernetes.
Um, so as mentioned, it's, it's non-trivial, you know, to deploy a non-trivial application on top of Kubernetes is, um, is hard, especially if it's like a stateful application, right? Um, you know, prior to this, you'd have to somehow manage all the bootstrapping and complexity and lifecycle management, failure recovery, all these different scenarios um, on Kubernetes. So this, op this concept of an operator is meant to kind of uh, encapsulate this this level of abstraction, um, and, and so you can kind of focus on um, the logic of what you want to do, and it reduces the complexity and boilerplate code you might do throughout. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a pattern for for building Kubernetes native application. It, it runs as a container, and so what we did is taking the operator framework. We built a uh, a Presto operator um, to, uh, to handle this. So the operator does uh, a few, a lot of things, but the four kind of main things that are unique to, to Presto that are worth mentioning is uh, auto configuration of the Presto cluster. Uh, I know I didn't see a lot of hands raised about who's used Presto, um, but you could uh, imagine with uh, a distributed system like Presto, um, it's pretty hard to configure. You have to tell the workers where the coordinator is. You have to uh, specify how much memory uh, to give it, how, how much, you know, what thread count is for the CPU utilization, um, uh, configuration of where to get the data. You have to tell Presto where the data is. Um, so there's like a lot of tweaks and knobs you have to do, but, um, you know, we can look at the, the system, the, you know, the CPU available, the memory available, um, and, and do a, a basic auto configuration of, of Presto to kind of get that that base configuration done for Presto. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, also the coordinator high availability. So if the coordinator becomes uh, unresponsive, if you remember from the diagram, I said there's one coordinator and any number of workers. So if a worker goes down, it's really not a big deal because you just have one less worker now. Of course, if a lot of them went down, then the, the performance gets slower. But if the coordinator ever goes down, that's a single point of failure, um, which means your system becomes inoperable. And, and so uh, the real cool thing about Kubernetes that helps here is if the coordinator goes down, it will just bring up uh, another one in a different pod, as long as there's availability on the Kubernetes cluster, of course. Um, you can figure it with worker auto-scaling, so based on CPU utilization, for example, um, you can start adding more workers so long as there's availability on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then finally, there's this notion what we call graceful scale down. So what happens is when you issue a Presto SQL query, the, the, all the workers are processing the data. So let's just say the, the demand on your, your cluster has gone down. The Presto workers may still be processing a query, maybe not as many queries, but still processing the query nonetheless. So you don't want to um, pause the cluster while you scale it down, and you certainly don't want to remove a worker while it's processing a query because that would ultimately fail the query. Um, so what we have this notion of a graceful scale down where when we determine, okay, we're going to go from 100 nodes to 25 nodes, um, we may mark 75 of those nodes. We'll tell Presto, hey, don't take any new work. Finish up what you're doing, and when you're done doing, shut down. So what that does is um, any new queries come in, they're only going to be running on the 25 nodes, and when the other 75 nodes finish up what they're doing, they'll shut down. Other things that we'll um, you know, be working on, um, you know, some, some degree of operator metering, um, this is another uh, thing that's important in the enterprise, uh, per se, is they want to know usage reporting or even to tag users to see how much resources they're using on the system. Um, there's a variety of reasons uh, that they may want to do this. One could be chargebacks. If uh, an organization or the, the IT org uh, has a Presto cluster for a bunch of departments, maybe they want to charge back to the different departments based on usage. Um, or as simple as just knowing how much they're using it. Um, you know, there are a variety of components. Um, first, there's the Presto Kubernetes custom uh, resource definition. Um, this will redefine the resource of a Presto type. Um, 
an instance, like when you instantiate this instance, that represents a Presto cluster on Kubernetes. Um, there's the Presto operator that continually monitors the Kubernetes resources, um, and it will create and remove a Presto resource um, uh, when asked for, so coordinator, a worker, and so on. Um, I think we've covered what a, a coordinator and worker do, but again, the coordinator is the, the central point responsible for issuing the queries uh, and implementing the queries, and the Presto workers are actually doing the query processing. Um, there's the coordinated services where we expose an external IP so you can actually connect to the Presto coordinator to actually issue queries uh, on the system. Um, we have a network policy. Uh, it's really for security. Um, for security, it allows the inbound traffic um, to the Presto workers from the, from the Presto coordinator. Um, the Metastore, which I spoke about, this is for if you're using distributed file stores that doesn't naturally have the catalog, you can keep it in the, the Metastore that we provide. Um, and then now if you want to ever, if you want to persist, so if you're using distributed file storage and you want to persist your table names, columns, column types, um, it would be wise to have a database that's backing this, whether it's Postgres or, or MySQL. Um, so you can connect to one that you can access outside the, the cluster, or we'll, if you just kind of want to get up and running fast and try it out, we do have this notion of um, uh, an internal Postgres that just runs on Kubernetes, but its life cycle starts and stops with the Presto cluster, so it's really only for kind of demonstration purposes. Um, and last is simple. Um, uh, you know, we can, uh, with a few commands, you can, you can deploy and... Um, uh, do it so in the, in the next five minutes I can demo this. Oh, you don't see my screen. All right, I have to look here. Okay, cool. So Sorry, it's just a little hard trying to see my screen here. All right. All right, so first of all, um, we'll use, let's make sure there's nothing there. Oh, yeah, of course I already have it running. <laughs> um, so let me delete it. Oh, yeah, sure. Let me, uh. Get this deleted first, and I'll work on that. Okay. I don't like it, huh? Back it bigger. Can you see that now? Is that good? In the back? Bigger? Is that even get? Is it getting bigger? Yeah, that is getting big. Okay, is that good? In the back? All right, cool. All right. So for for time purposes, I'm not going to tear down and bring up the operator, but there's an operator running. So what we do is I have this. Um, YAML file that defines um, what we want to deploy for Presto. I can show that in a moment too. Uh, and now we've created it. Let me see if I can bring that example over here too. All right, so it looks something like this. Well, um, you know, it's we're not going to go through it all today, but you know you can say, okay, use Prometheus as the monitoring tool. Um, you specify, you know, the type of CPU you want for the coordinator, um, workers. I'm choosing nine workers in this case, um, and so on. So um, uh, I'm not going to go through it all today, but that's that's sort of how you how you define it. Now, so if we do we get pods again? All right, you'll see there's a bunch running now. And now what we want to do is we want to do expose. 
Right. So we are um, setting up the IP for external Metastore. Um, it takes a few seconds. So an astute adver, uh, observer will see that there are only eight workers running. That's because the Kubernetes cluster wasn't big enough. Okay. Well, anyways, well that's starting a lot. Let me just go back to the the, the final slides here. Um, uh, so if you want to customize the the solution, um, we do have as well as a Bootstrap script. Um, so if you want to set up security or download additional software you can. Um, or, of course, for more heavy customization, let's say you want to install additional software on there or do something else, um, you can use a custom Docker image. You just pull from the one we have, um, and then you, you build your own, and then you can specify it um, in the configuration. Um, so you can, you can join the community. Um, uh, there's a mailing list, uh, there's development Slack, uh, GitHub, uh, you can follow um, on Twitter as well. Um, and then uh, we at Starburst, we, we have a monthly newsletter, um, so I'd highly encourage you to sign up for that if you want to learn more about Presto. We're just kind of seeing what's going on in the community. Um, Presto news, events, how to, um, we just kind of aggregate it all and put it in your, in your inbox. And of course, um, you know, contributors welcome. So, um, you know, if you want to learn more about sort of the vision and de development philosophy contribution process uh, to Presto, you can you can go to PrestoSQL.io and and learn about that. All right, let's go back real quick um, to the demo here. I realize I have only a couple minutes, but I think we can do this. Did I copy that all? Is it highlighted? All right, I'll figure it out. I get it here. Oh, it didn't even work. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to see. That's um, I'm uh, straining here. Didn't like that, huh? I'll write it in manually. So that's 34 dot 73 dot, is that 230? And 130. All right, so here we are. Press is running nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's uh, Presto running um, nine worker nodes on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and I'm told I'm short on time, so I can definitely take some questions. Um, I guess one final piece or plug, of course, is um, at Starburst we're hiring. So if anyone here is interested, um, reach out. Cool. Can I take some questions? Up to you. Uh, quick question: Does Presto have a reduced like SQL language that you have to use because it supports so many different things? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, no, actually, Presto follows the SQL standard uh, quite close. Um, so the reason for that is so you can use your um, your favorite BI tools or SQL developer tools, so they all kind of just work seamlessly with those. So the Presto connector will handle any sort of nuances or translations to the underlying data sources. So you use standard SQL, but if there's some MySQL or Postgres nuance, Presto, the connector figures out that kind of translation. But good question. Hey, Matt. Um, so you mentioned that Presto is not doing any storage, uh, but is there a way to set up any sort of caching mechanism to improve, like, query timing or anything? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, 
so um, uh, there's a open source project called Aluxio, um, and um, you can uh, essentially just deploy it with Presto. So that's really good for uh, cloud storage um, or sort of like hybrid or multi-cloud scenarios where the data isn't necessarily close to you or you have to go over the network and reach it. Um, so it has a variety of caching uh, algorithms it uses and based on your workload, you can choose which one you want. But um, so if you if you issue queries and the data becomes hot, then subsequent queries will, will speed up. Um, and uh, we are actually a partner with them as well. So um, if, if one is looking to deploy both, we, we offer Starburst with caching, which is essentially that. Um, does Presto use any any um, integration with the scheduler on, on Kubernetes to schedule better the workers based on load and, and the uh, execution plan or something? Um, Presto itself does not natively uh, integrate with um, the, the scheduler, um, but I would like to talk more about with that with you off offline, maybe after the chat. Um, I'd be interested to know what you had in mind. Probably the last one I'm imagining. Cause... Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned JDBC as a connector tool for, for some of these uh, data stores. Are there any uh, shortcomings in using JDBC? Are there better yes. methods for yep. faster access? And Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so JDBC really isn't meant to be a big data pipe, right? It's, of course, the easiest way to write a connector to uh, a data source because it's a standard interface. Um, but uh, so some of the proprietary connectors that we have at Starburst, we what I say is like a native direct connection. Um, so, for example, um, our uh, Teradata connector we have actually connect directly to the AMPs. And we bypass JDBC entirely. So the AMPs, if you're familiar with Teradata, I'm, I'm sure people in here are not, but um, the AMPs will then be pushing the data to Presto. So we do it in a completely parallel way instead of a, a single uh, pipe way as well. And we're doing that with uh, Snowflake as well, our Snowflake connector. Um, but great question. Um, I think we're out of time, but thanks everyone for uh, coming to the talk. And um, I'll uh, I'll be mulling around, I guess, out there later. If anyone has any additional questions. <laughs>